Hello, my friends. I want to tell you about this uh, little project I did last week, uh, which might be bringing a bit of a, um, a security vulnerability in the world. So let's just dive right into it. So the project is called SSH Now. And the motivation for this uh, was really when working with CI systems recently. So uh, if you've ever used Circle CI, and ju just for those who don't know, a, a CI system is a system where you can run tests and other jobs, which is uh, very frequently used uh, in software development. Um, Circle CI is one of them, and it has this handy button that says rerun with SSH, which uh, runs your job but gives you a command that you can copy paste into your uh, local terminal and you can SSH into the remote machine and do uh, some local debugging there. Very useful, especially if um, something is failing uh, uh, in, in this CI job and you can't reproduce it locally. So you really want to um, get that quick feedback loop where, you, uh, where you're playing with it directly. Now, I recently was using some CI systems uh, that don't have this feature. And I wanted something similar, right? I wanted uh, to just be able to SSH into this remote machine. Um, and for various reasons, this wasn't always possible. Um, and so I came up with this idea, wouldn't it be great if you can just go to a website and it gives you a thing that you can copy paste into your CI scripts, but maybe also into other um, like, yeah, remote jobs or servers that you might have, like anywhere where you can run a Linux command, you should be able to like just drop this in and then you should just get a terminal in the browser, right? Like that would really make things super easy uh, that is connected to that remote machine. And I was like, this, this could be quite, quite useful, right? Like there's some, uh, some, some use cases even beyond this CI thing that I ran into, right? Like you could imagine um, if you can just uh, give this command to, uh, 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 to a friend, then you can help them out with uh, s some debugging on their machine. Um, so instead of doing a screen share, or maybe in addition to doing a screen share, you can actually kind of work together on um, uh, on their machine, uh, especially if we were to make this um, this web-based interface collaborative, right? We could make it so you can share the URL here with a friend uh, or a colleague, and you can collaborate on um, uh, debugging a CI machine or like their machine or your machine or whatever. And then there's all sorts of ways that you can expand this, right? You can maybe say, oh, like let's uh, let's just run this command uh, at startup uh, for a lot of servers. And we can have like a whole like, you know, a user system where you can log in and see all of your servers or all of the servers at your company and so on. And there's like systems like this that, that exist already. But um, yeah, it's, uh, we, 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 we could have an interesting sort of like simple starting point that solves one particular very focused use case, but then gradually say, oh, you can use this for more and more things and layer on more and more features and sort of gradually upgrade your path from just a simple use case to using it for many more things. Um, so that could be like a lot of the existing tools for managing servers and so on are like pretty heavy handed. You need to really put a lot of work into setting it up and this could be a much more sort of gradual uh, onboarding path. So anyway, I had these uh, these ideas, right? Like there's a bunch of existing projects, but none of them uh, do quite sort of this this initial thing that I envision, right? So this this page is out there. I tweeted about it. Um, you you can have a look if you're curious. So what I wanted to do in this video is show you um, show you the prototype that I built. So I built sort of this initial ver version. I have no idea if I'll take it any further than this, but I figured it might be uh, might be fun to sort of see how this how this works, and maybe um, maybe if you're not that familiar with 
how TCP works or how WebSockets work, like how any part of the, the stack works. Maybe, yeah, uh, maybe you can learn something this way. So let me, let me first do a little demo, right? So we can go to this sshnow.com thing um, here. And immediately we get redirected to this thing that has like this, um, uh, uh, this very long token in it. I deliberately made this token so long that uh, if you accidentally, you know, see it in a screen share like I'm doing right now, you typically don't have the entire thing. So you, um, you can't just, uh, uh, you know, take it because it's sort of uh, clipped off. I did, yeah, okay. Now, now you can see it, right? Now you can reconstruct it only if I do it like that or if I make the window really big. Anyway, so we just got this thing, this command, and we say, great, we copy that and I open a terminal. So here I have a terminal. Let me actually go to um, our SSH now folder. It doesn't really matter, but then we'll have uh, some stuff to look at. Let me make this a little bit bigger for you. So I paste it in here and I press enter and boom, here we now get a terminal, right? And so we can do stuff and you can see that these are indeed the files that we have here. You know, we can see that we're indeed at this um, path and we can now copy this uh, thing and we have some very basic collaboration features. So this was a little bit uh, beyond the scope of a V1, but it was easy enough to do. So if we do this here, we will sort of see the output in both places. You don't see, you know, the exact same history. I didn't want to store the history on the server, uh, sort of, you know, for security purposes. Um, and you currently don't see when I type stuff here, right? Uh, you only see it when I actually press enter. It's reflected on the other side. And you do then see the command that was actually used. You just don't see me typing it live. So that would be a fun additional feature. We just don't, don't have that quite yet. Okay. So how does all of this work? Well, it might be um, useful to take a step back and see sort of like the types of techniques that I'm using here. So what we are doing, like this is sort of the heart of it, like this part right here. So this is a te technique that kind of comes from the hacking scene, right? Like offensive security, trying to break into machines and uh, run remote code. So what you do there, um, you really need something that can run on like any machine, right? Like if, you, if you're hacking into a system and at some point you have a remote code execution and you can sort of run arbitrary code, you want to run something that regardless of like the type of machine uh, that you're dealing with, it will kind of give you a remote shell. And so, I stole that um, technique because I also wanted uh, what, what we have here to be um, sort of system agnostic, right? It should really work for any type of um, remote machine as long as it runs some like Unix-like system. So here, you know, you can see that it works on Mac OS. Uh, it should also work on Linux, although I haven't really tested that quite yet. Um, so normally the way that, uh, that you would do this is you would say, um, well, okay, let's actually start, start maybe a little bit simpler. Uh, we can't even exit out of this. Uh, right now I'll have to restart the terminal, which, uh, which we'll do. This is all pretty hacky, prototypey. I started this, you know, I did this project basically um, in like two and a half, three days, some, something like that, like maybe 20 hours or so. Um, right, so let's, let's start with the basics, right? Um, how do you communicate at the most basic level between two machines? So a very simple thing uh, that you can do is called, uh, is, is using this tool called Netcat, where you can expose a TCP socket. And TCP, you can look this up, this is like a very basic, like very low level fundamental protocol uh, that is used on the internet. Things like HTTP, you know, like going to connecting to a website, all of that uses TCP under the hood. 
So in TCP, what we can do with TCP, yeah, we can uh, we can say using this tool called netcat, we can say, okay, I'm going to listen uh, on this particular port. And sort of in the in the hacking community, there's like 137 lead. There's this whole lead speak thing. Anyway, I stuck with that tradition. So we're going to use port 1337 and we're going to listen on it, right? And you don't see anything right now because we're not, there's no one connected to this port. Once you have a port like this open and you're listening to it, um, someone else, you know, on on this network or maybe even on the internet, if I, you know, open my port on my uh, router, uh, can connect to this port. And so we can do that. We can say we're going to connect to localhost, which is this IP address, and then this port, right? And now I can send stuff over and it will appear here. And I can also send stuff back, right? So it is a connection that goes in both directions. And we can have multiple of these theoretically. I don't know if that works with Netcat though. Um, like if I do another one and I say hi here. Yeah, so Netcat only works with like the first connection, but you can actually have like multiple connections open on the same TCP port. Um, I think in, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's a Netcat thing. I'm not 100% sure about that. Someone can correct me in the comments. So, um then what you do you know if you're uh, if you're doing this remote code execution on some arbitrary machine um there's this trick where you have this shell right so bin uh, slash sh is sort of the standard posix shell i believe i think every sort of posix compliant unix machine has to uh has to have this and it has to behave in a certain way so this, this shell is a thing that is like a very basic shell, right? You can do, do things like this. And the shell, uh, you can run in this particular way where you say, um, actually connect instead of, you know, um, like what, what we did here, is it, um, well, there, there's, there's, there's some details, there, but basically you can have this shell connect to a TCP port in the same way as we just did with Netcat and have all of its input and output be directed over that TCP port. So let's actually do that here and we'll do it with localhost again. And I believe that this like dev TCP thing is something that is like special to this shell and it doesn't actually work in my current shell. Like if I do this here, it says like my, my current shell, which is the Z shell, doesn't understand this. So we actually first have to actually go into uh, into this shell and use the shell. That is why we kind of call the shell twice, right? We wrap it around uh, it. Uh, in any case, uh, if we now run this, it should work. Uh, and let's have like Netcat listen to this port again. Right, so now we're going to do this. And boom, we get our shell here, right? So the, the shell is being directed over Netcat. Um, and so this is, uh, this is quite a neat trick. Um, there's a couple of problems with this if you want to use this. So initially, this is what I used essentially um, for debugging my remote CI machine. The thing that is annoying about it is you have to kind of expose your public IP address. Um, and then you also have to open this port on your router and make sure that it actually redirects it to this particular machine on my network, right? So if I have like lots of different machines, like, um, yeah, if someone tries to connect to this port, like normally a router would just refuse all um, TCP connections on all ports because uh, it wouldn't know where to send it. Uh, but once you have the connection established and open, just like before, it's bi-directional, right? We can send data here and we can get data back. And it's sort of like a tunnel or, yeah, it's it's a, a socket, yeah, there's, there's different, uh, but that, that's hard to think about it. There's like a connection that is now established. Okay, so, so this is, 
it's it's not too bad to to use this trick, but it's it's not super great. And that is where I got the idea for sort of mediating this through this website uh, that just kind of handles all of this stuff for you. So what is the idea then? So the idea is that we have um, this machine that listens to this port and anyone can connect to it. Um, and then once you connect to it, um, we should somehow say like we are, we are like this particular session that sort of corresponds with, you know, like this particular URL that the user had opened. Right, like if I go to a different one, like if I have it auto-generate a different one, we'll, um, uh, we'll get a different session ID here. So that's the idea here. We set this environment variable uh, before we launch this shell. And then the first thing that we do sort of here, right? Like here, like we can pretend that we're, we're sort of the server, right? Like this thing has connected to us and now we can you know, issue a command like echoing this thing and see like which, uh, which ID that we have here. And then we can say, okay, aha, we know, we know this session, it corresponds to uh, this particular URL and we're going to uh, uh, let the browser um, that has this URL open know about that we have established a connection and we'll then tunnel everything sort of, you know, from, from this end machine to, um, uh, to the browser. And so on the browser side, what we use for this is this uh, thing called WebSockets. You can also look that up. It's very similar to what we were doing here with like listening uh, over Netcat. It's just the equivalent of that, but for the browser. That's why it has the word web in front. It's a web socket, not just a regular um, TCP socket. Okay, so how does that work then? Um, and in fact, actually, we, we can do this, right? So we can, let's get out of this. Let's see, how do we get out of here? Okay, here, great. So we can connect in the same way that we connected to our local thing. We can connect to this, this IP address, right? And we can see what happens when we do this. So it immediately just issues this command. And then since we didn't right away respond with, you know, echoing this information back to it, it closed the connection. Because it was like, oh, uh, clearly it isn't, uh, you know, this, like this command wasn't run here, but, but we, we see this, right? This is what the server uh, sends to us. And we'll, let me do that again. It sends it and then it closes the connection. I think I set a timeout for like half a second or so. So let's see how this is implemented in code. So we have a very simple Node.js server. Um, yeah, it just starts Node with this uh, app.js. So let's have a look at that. So, okay, this is our app.js. There's, there's quite a bit going on here, but we, um, we can get there uh, pretty quickly. So let's skip over all of this stuff. Um, here at the bottom, we start a web server uh, just at port 80, uh, and this web server, let's see, it serves a bunch of standard stuff, right? It has like an FAQ page. Um, when you go to the home page, we redirect to, uh, uh, to get like this long uh, number here, like a random one. So we have this function to generate this like long session ID. And by the way, we have a long session ID f uh, versus a short session ID. Um, the idea is that the long session ID, if you hash it, you get the short one, but you, but you can't go back from the short one to the long one. So if accidentally you see, you know, you leak this thing or you post it in like a public CI system or someone else sees it, uh, they can't just, you know, go and plug this in here and get access to your machine. Like, there's some other exploits that you can do that, that they can do, which are in the FAQ, but they don't immediately get access to your machine. So that is uh, that is nice. So that's why we have this long session ID and the short session ID. Okay. So then there's two two types of sockets that we open, right? We open this port uh, one three three seven, 
that we listen to. And then we also have this uh, WebSocket thing. But let's first look at how this 1337 port uh, works. So let's see. So for that, um, we use this module in Node.js uh, called Net. And you can just open a, a server and that really just opens a, a TCP socket. Um, so here we just have hard coded. We have this, this thing and we're going to listen on this server. Great. And then when we get a connection, we get this socket, right? So that is basically this, uh, this function gets called, for example, when, when we do this, right? When we execute this, this com command, we, uh, we uh, establish a connection. Um, and so then what we say is like, okay, um, the first thing that we do is we write this to the socket, right? So this is what we just saw, this echo. And uh, and then what we expect, right, is we expect some uh, some data to come back, right? Because um, we expect that the user is running is is running this thing here, right? It's running an actual shell, and so echoing this variable should should print like this variable uh, uh, back to us. So then, yeah, we we listen to any sort of data on the socket. Uh, this can come in in chunks, which, um, yeah, we'll just have to append the chunks uh, to each other until we kind of see the data that we expect back. This uh, uh, this uh, short session ID, and then when we get that, we uh, we extract it from it, and we we can say, oh, uh, we have a new session, right, with this session ID, and then we have basically these two variables, like these two hash maps where we say this is uh, these are all our remote sockets so we now say okay we register um, for this uh, short session ID uh, we register this current socket um, and then when we get any more uh, uh, even more data we say oh we actually have a short session ID uh, now right like that, that is associated with this uh, with this socket right we just have a variable here that we that we kind of close over here right so this is associated sort of with with all of these functions here so yeah so so we set that when when we get the uh, the data back and then when we have it um, any any further data that we get we just forward it directly uh, to the web sockets. Um, so at that point, we're just tunneling information, right? Any data that we get on our uh, port 1337, we forward to the web sockets. So how do the web sockets work? Um, and, and there's some other stuff here, right? Like we need to do some cleanup when the, when the socket gets closed and stuff like that. And there's this timeout that I mentioned. If we still don't have a, a session ID after like half a second, we just, uh, we just close the socket. Okay, so then we also have a WebSocket. So that is uh, uh, at this URL, so at slash WebSocket and then the ID. Um, we listen for, for WebSocket, so we can actually look at this here. So if we refresh this and we look at um, our network tab, we can see all of our WebSocket calls. And indeed here we have a WebSocket call that goes to SSH now slash WebSocket and then this whole ID again. Um, which, you know, if this was a live stream, someone could over, could take over my, my terminal now, right? Because you see, you see this whole ID, um, but I will close it before I post this on YouTube. So then how does this work? Um, it's very similar. We, uh, we basically always work with short session IDs here, right? Like all um, like these two um, hash maps that I mentioned earlier, they are indexed by short session ID. So the first thing that we do is we, um, uh, where was I here? We go from the long session ID to the short session ID. We also check that it's a val valid long, long session ID. Um, and then we register uh, our WebSocket here. Um, and then there's a very similar thing. When we get a message on our WebSocket, uh, we just say, okay, are there any, um, 
any remote sockets, right? Like any um, any sockets that were connected to our port 1337. If so, we just forward our message to it. Um, very easy. Um, and then we also have a little piece of code that does the collaboration, right? We also send uh, send the message to all the other web sockets, uh, but prefix with uh, with sort of this this thing, so it looks like uh, you know what we what we saw uh, what we saw earlier. Um, you see the command when you press enter. You see it uh, uh, appear on the other pages. Um, yeah, so that is basically all that there is to it. When you get a message on the web socket, you send it to the port 137 socket. When you get a message uh, on the port 137 socket, you send it to all of the uh, the web sockets. And yeah, we can briefly look at what this code looks like. It's very similar, right? We just look at all of the uh, uh, the web sockets and we, and we send the message there. Great, and then the only other thing is that yeah, we actually um, serve our index.html. There's like a couple of like variables that we replace in it, right? Um, like like the, uh, the short session ID and stuff like that. Uh, and so, yeah, we can look at the client side code here. Um, like here, we just have like our command, right? And we have some CSS that like positions this in the center of the screen. And then um, here, the first thing that we, well, the very first thing that we do is we redirect to HTTPS if we're uh, on HTTP. And then what we do is we connect to the WebSocket, right? So we have, yeah, like when the, uh, the page is loaded, we connect to the WebSocket. We also connect to the WebSocket if it ever gets disconnected, right? If, the, if your internet goes offline and then it comes back up later, we just reconnect then. So we put all of this in a big function. So here we then, um, let's see, yeah, we initialize the socket, right? We use the WebSocket protocol, which is like if you're doing local development, it will be this, but uh, online it will be uh, WSS, which is like um, uh, the encrypted version. And then, yeah, just the, the current host name slash this. And so th that is the path that we saw earlier. <laughs> And then we say, okay, whenever we get a message in, if we don't have a terminal instance yet, we create a new one. We use this library uh, called xterm.js, uh, which is excellent. And we also use this library that does like a local, uh, little local terminal for it. Um, and so, yeah, we then say whenever we get a message, we write that message to the uh, to the terminal, you know, after it has been initialized for the first time. And then we read a new line from the user. And this read a new line from the user uses this local echo library where we say we have like this prompt and gives you some nice things. Like if we uh, do this again, um, it gives you things like, you know, you can move your cursor back and forth. And if I do this, it has like a history, right? You can go uh, up and down, stuff like that. So it's a nice little library for, for things like that. Um, yeah, and then when it reads, when you press enter, we get into this function and we just send it over the WebSocket. And there's like a little timeout. Uh, if we don't get any data back, we just uh, uh, read a new line then. Yeah, so that is really all that there is to it. Um, like I said, like in this document, I have some ideas for how to expand this. Um, it's also, <laughs> A little bit tricky, right? Like if, uh, uh, wait, what, what is going on here? Uh, for some reason, you can't click the FAQ after. I have to fix that. Um, yeah, there's like some uh, some information I put here about like how to think about the security of this, right? Because there's some interesting vulnerabilities. Like if, um, well, first of all, <laughs> someone can just go to, uh, go to this uh, this thing and just really make a lot of connections and just crash my server. Right now, there's not really any scaling happening. Right? How would you scale something like this? Well, you would really have to um, primarily sort of scale. Sc yeah, like this is currently depending on the fact that this, this is all being run on a single machine, right? Because we keep these associations here. 
you could use some other mechanism for that. You could use some sort of like sharding mechanism where we say uh, we give like different IP addresses based on like, I don't know, like the first few characters in this uh, URL or something. That's a one way of sharding it. Um, you can do even more complicated schemes where you have like, uh, where you actually put this in some sort of database and you have like a message bus. So that's the machine that actually listens to the sockets and the machine that does the web sockets can be two different machines. Um, yeah, there's, there's like different, different ways of scaling this. Um, the bigger issues here are that uh, this data to my machine, right, to, to, to my server that's, that is hosting this is not encrypted right now. So anyone can snoop on that. Um, usually it's just like data centers and so on. So that's not too concerning. But also you have to trust that this is the actual codes that I'm running on that machine, right? Like I could be untrustworthy and be actually logging this information and stealing your data. So what would be a lot better is if we could um, uh, do end-to-end -end encryption that like really starts when the message gets sent here and is only decrypted in the, um, in the browser. The problem with that is that um, uh, right now, this is like very universal code, right? Like I said, this is very similar to how hackers um, exploit machines where they don't necessarily know what is actually running there. And so this really works, should should work everywhere. I haven't extensively test, tested it, but it should really work everywhere because we don't use any particular features. Once you start doing encryption on the client side here, um, you need you probably need a bunch of libraries you you start depending on more on like what is happening on that machine and there's certainly ways ways to to do that um a, a, a similar thing that would be very nice to have is like having like a much better um uh, sort of terminal connection um right now this is not what it's what is called like a tti uh terminal this is actually just running sort of a script anyway the details here don't really matter but like the terminal is not very nice you can't really for example run vi on it or like a, a proper editor or um, it's a very very rudimentary basic terminal but again if you want to have like a nicer thing like you start depending on uh, what is actually running on that machine like what is the processor architecture like like you start depending on all sorts of things um so yeah, like that, that, that is a challenge, both sort of for, you know, having a nicer terminal, so, so for usability, but also if you want to do end-to-end -end encryption, uh, things like that. Um, yeah, and there's some, some fun exploits that you, that you can do, um, where if this gets accidentally leaked, you can kind of also make a connection to this. And even though you can't take over the remote machine, you can see all of the commands that are being sent to it, or you can respond in ways that uh, uh, might trick the user in, like, yeah, you can confuse the user and think that they're think talking to like their actual CI machine while they're like talking to your machine, and you can maybe trick them into um, uh, divulging some some information. Um, that that's the main thing. That is why you should really not make this public, <laughs> right? Like that is. Uh, uh, that is dangerous. So anyway, this is a fun little project. There's some ideas for how to how to make this bigger, uh, how to expand on this. Um, the, all of the code for this is open source. It's on GitHub. Um, if anyone wants to collaborate with me on this, uh, let me know. I don't don't have any particular plans for this. I just wanted to build this uh, this silly prototype. But um, if you think that this is interesting and you you do want to improve some some of the things here then uh, definitely reach out to me it would be uh, it would be delightful to uh, to expand on this and uh, and work with y'all all right that is what I have for today thanks for listening and uh, see you around <laughs>